Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is our 135th deck and it's titled The Saga of Tom Bombadil. And if you haven't seen the show before, what we're doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So starting off, we gotta of course talk about our card of the week which was suggested to us by Spencer Hart over on YouTube. And that card, as you may be able to guess by the title of this video, is Tom Bombadil. So Tom Bombadil is one of every color, so white, blue, black, red, green, for a 4-4 legendary creature god bard. As long as there are four or more lower counters among sagas you control, Tom Bombadil has hexproof and indestructible. Then, whenever the final chapter ability of a saga you control resolves, Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a Saga card. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This ability triggers only once each turn. So before we start talking about the deck itself, it is important to mention that an unspoken rule of the channel is that if we ever get a legendary creature, or at least a card that can be a commander as our random card of the week, then obviously they have to be our commander because that is the best way to possibly build around that card. So that is what we are doing. And since Tom Bombadil cares so much about sagas, you can probably guess where this is going as we jump into our themes, because our very first theme for the deck is sagas. And specifically, we want to try to make sure that we always have Tom Bombadil's first ability active, the one that makes sure that he is hexproof and indestructible if we have four or more lore counters. So that is where Long List of the Ents is really going to shine. Because Long List of the Ents is a single green mana for a Saga that has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 total chapters, and every single chapter is the exact same. Note a creature type that hasn't been noted for Long List of the Ents. When you cast your next creature spell of that type this turn, that creature enters the battlefield with an additional plus 1 plus 1 counter. Now, if we're being perfectly honest, the counter is not that relevant. We're probably not going to care too much about that, but this is a great way to make sure that we have the counters on the board to make sure that Tom Bombadil can't be targeted and can't be destroyed. Plus, this is also just something that can trigger Tom Bombadil if we're able to get it down on turn one, and then we're able to cast Tom Bombadil, I guess technically on turn four, then we'd be able to make sure that it goes off on turn five. It's not super likely we can cast Tom Bombadil on turn four, though, so maybe wait until turn two to cast it, but still something to consider. Our next theme, though, since we're already playing around with sagas, we might as well also play with some enchantresses, because all we've got to do is cast a saga, which is an enchantment, and trigger the effects of cards like Seder Enchanter, because Seder Enchanter is one green and a white for a 2-2 Seder Druid. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell, draw a card. So as long as we're casting sagas, which is something we want to do anyway, we can be drawing cards and finding other ways to benefit from it. And really, that is going to be one of the bulk ways that we're drawing cards in this deck. Yeah, there are ways that our sagas can do it on their own, but the Enchantress effects are really going to be where most of our card advantage comes from. And then finally, our last theme, which I think is the thing that's going to make this deck the most unique, is going to be ways to manipulate counters. So the interesting thing about the way that sagas work is that they only trigger the lore effect, or the chapter effect, I suppose I should say, when the lore counter moves up to a specific time. So for example, if Long List of the Ents goes from 1 to 2 lore counters, it's going to trigger the effect and we're going to get to use its ability again. But if we go from 2 lore counters down to 1, nothing actually happens. And that becomes incredibly relevant when we're talking about the last lore counter on our sagas. Tom Bombadil cares about that last lore counter ability resolving. It never says anything about sacrificing our sagas. So if we go up to level 6 on Long List of the Ents, and then we remove a counter before the ability resolves, the saga doesn't actually sacrifice itself, and we just go back to 5. However, in the eyes of Tom Bombadil, we have in fact resolved the last ability of a saga, meaning we get to reveal cards from the top of our deck until we hit a saga and put it into play, but we never lost the original saga. And so because of that, cards that manipulate counters and can remove them or even sometimes add to them 
can be very, very important. And that is where Goldberry River Daughter comes in, which flavor-wise is great. We got to get Tom Bombadil's actual wife in here as well. Goldberry is one and a blue for a 1-3 legendary creature nymph. Tap, move a counter of each kind, not on Goldberry River Daughter, from another target permanent you control onto Goldberry. Then you can pay a blue and tap her to move one or more counters from Goldberry onto another target permanent you control if you do draw a card. This can be incredibly useful in a couple of different ways because we can move all the lore counters from Long List of the Ents, which would be six possibly, all the way over to Goldberry, and then all of a sudden, Long List of the Ents has no counters on it, so it's just going to start over and go again. But then we can take the counters that we put onto Goldberry and either put them back on Long List of the Ents or put them somewhere else entirely. So we can fully control what's happening with our sagas at any given time and find ways to either remove or add lore counters when we feel we need them. So that is what our deck is all about. We're kind of trying to, to game the system a little bit when it comes to sagas. We want to keep them on the board, but also still be activating their final abilities while drawing cards and casting them all at the same time. So with those themes in mind, let's jump into our key card section and talk about some of the true MVPs of this deck. So the first card that I would like to discuss is going to be Clock Spinning. And normally, this card really only shows up in suspend style decks because you can just cast it to remove a counter from a suspend card. But it's going to actually be really important for our deck too. So Clock Spinning is a single blue for an instant. It has buyback for three. So if we pay an additional three mana as the spell resolves, we put it back into our hand. And what it does is we choose a counter on target permanent or suspended card, remove that counter from that permanent or card, or put another of those counters on it. The reason this is going to be so important for us is because for four mana, we can at instant speed add or remove a counter from one of our sagas and then still keep clock spinning to do it again next turn. So essentially we can use this to keep triggering our sagas specifically in our draw step. So we're going to draw, we're going to trigger all of our sagas, all the abilities are going to go on the stack. And so now we have a saga, possibly, that's about to sacrifice itself because we hit the final lore counter, the final lore ability is on the stack. So we can cast clock spinning in response, remove a counter from it. That ability stays on the stack, it resolves, possibly triggers Tom Bombadil if he's in play, and then we still have Clock Spinning to be able to do it again next turn. So this is incredibly important as instant speed manipulation of counters that is only limited by the amount of mana we have, and we may not necessarily get into it in this video, but we can generate a ton of mana in this deck. So... I do think Clock Spinning deserves a spot in our key cards, and it's probably, if I had to pick, the MVP of the deck. But moving into our second key card, this one is going to be Gloin Dwarf Emissary. Gloin is two and a red for a 3-3 legendary creature dwarf advisor. Whenever you cast a historic spell, create a treasure token. This ability triggers only once each turn. Tap, sacrifice a treasure, goad target creature. Now, if we're being perfectly honest, the ability triggering only once each turn is not ideal, but being able to make a treasure at least once a turn when we're casting a saga is incredibly powerful. And it's even more powerful because we don't always need to use the treasure for mana. We can use it to goad creatures because we're not going to be putting up a ton of defenses. Um, Tom Bombadil is really going to be our most important line of defense, and that is not really always going to be a guarantee. We can't guarantee we're going to have four lore counters to make him indestructible. So if we need to send our opponent's creatures somewhere else, Gloin is a great way to do that. Now, moving into our last key card, this one's going to look very different from the first two, because this one is Historian's Boon. The first two work well with sagas, but Historian's Boon truly cares about sagas. And the nice thing about Historian's Boon is that it really is a powerful win condition in our deck, for a lot of similar reasons to Tom Bombadil. So Historian's Boon is three and a white for an enchantment. Whenever Historian's Boon or another non-token enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 white soldier creature token. I would like to remind everybody that enchantments are sagas. 
or I suppose sagas are enchantments. It's like the rectangles and squares argument. And whenever the final chapter ability of a saga you control triggers, create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying and vigilance. Again, the important phrasing here is when the final chapter ability of a saga you control triggers. We do not have to sacrifice the saga to get the angel. So if we are using clock spinning or goldberry or whatever else to prevent us from sacrificing the saga, but still triggering the final chapter ability, we still get the angel, we still get to keep the saga, and this one doesn't trigger once each turn. We could, in theory, make an entire army of angels out of nowhere if all of our sagas trigger at the same time. So Historian's Boon is one of the best win conditions in the deck because it just continuously pumps out creatures. And yeah, 4-4s four aren't that big, but they have flying, they have vigilance, and at some point they're able to just close out games. So those are our key cards. And I think the next thing we got to do is take a look at some cool interactions in this deck. Some cards that either synergize very well together or sometimes are just fun synergies that I want to talk about. So... Starting off with our first pair of cards, we have Kiora Bests the Sea God and Power Conduit. So Kiora Bests the Sea God is one of the better sagas in our deck. It's five blue blue for a saga. Number one, create an 8-8 eight, eight blue Kraken creature token with hexproof. Number two, tap all non-land permanents target opponent controls. They don't untap during their controller's next untap step. And three, gain control of target permanent and opponent controls untap it. So this obviously goes very well with some of our counter manipulation strategies, and a great one is going to be Power Conduit. Power Conduit, two mana for an artifact. Tap, remove a counter from a permanent you control, and choose one. Put a charge counter on target artifact, or put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. Now, the reason I chose these two cards in particular, though, is because Kiora Best the Sea God is good at every single level. If we are able to remove a counter from it every single turn, we can make sure that we're constantly hitting any of the three modes, which means we can just make an army of 8-8 Krakens, we can always tap down our opponent's stuff, or we can just keep stealing our opponent's stuff. All of those are incredibly powerful and potentially game-winning. And Power Conduit is one of those counter manipulators that, yeah, we can only use it once a turn, but it's good no matter what, because it is worst case scenario, we tap it to remove a counter and just put a charge counter on itself, which is not the worst thing in the world. But most of the time, we're going to be able to put a plus one plus one counter on something like Tom Bombadil, who is hexproof and indestructible, maybe an 8-8 Kraken maybe a 4-4 Angel. Whatever we're doing, we're able to continuously pump up our board and push ourselves toward a victory with all of the powerful effects from Kiora Best the Sea God. So I do think that both of these cards are very good on their own in this deck, but obviously together they make a very powerful combo that is going to be difficult for our opponents to deal with. Moving on, though, to our second cool interaction of the deck. This time we have One Ring to Rule Them All and Thief of Blood. So one ring to rule them all, two black black for, of course, a saga. Level one, the ring tempts you. Then each player mills cards equal to your ring bearer's power. Number two, destroy all non-legendary creatures. And number three, each opponent loses one life for each creature card in that player's graveyard. And so we are going to partner that up with Thief of Blood. And Thief of Blood is another card that I honestly debated on putting into the key card section because I think this could be an MVP of the deck because it is four black black for a 1-1 one, one vampire. Six mana 1-1, one, one, not great, but I promise it gets better. It has flying, and as Thief of Blood enters the battlefield, remove all counters from all permanents. Thief of Blood enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it for each counter removed this way. Now... This is very unique wording on a card because it doesn't say permanence we control, so it hits every player, and it doesn't say remove counters from creatures or remove plus one plus one counters. This removes counters from sagas. So if we have maybe say long list of the ents, we could potentially have up to six lore counters on long list of the ents. We cast Thief of Blood, it removes all six, it gets plus six plus six, and now we just have a seven seven flyer. And that is pretty low bar 
when you consider that a lot of our sagas are going to be on the battlefield at the same time. So if we can have even just say four sagas that all have two lore counters on them, we're pulling off eight counters, and then there's a chance we have more that have three, four, five lore counters. Maybe our opponent's creatures have plus one, plus one counters. Maybe some of our creatures have plus one, plus one counters. Thief of Blood can get absolutely huge. And if it's getting absolutely huge, that makes it perfect for one ring to rule them all. Because just the first level of one ring to rule them all just has us being tempted by the ring. So we can choose Thief of Blood to be our ring bearer. And then each player mills cards equal to our ring bearer's power. So if for some reason, say Thief of Blood gets to be a 10-10, we can then make each player mill 10. And with our counter manipulation, we could actually make our opponents mill 10 every single turn by resetting one ring to rule them all and then just doing it again. And if that's not even just the best case scenario, or I guess worst case scenario, depending on your position at the table, we can also then destroy all non-legendary creatures, which won't affect Thief of Blood because it's been tempted by the ring and is now our ring bearer, and make our opponents lose life for creature cards in their graveyard. So Thief of Blood can just kind of swing in and close out the game. So this can be an incredibly powerful combination of cards, especially if played in the right order. And one of the nice things, too, is if we happen to cast one ring to rule them all before Thief of Blood, then we can cast Thief of Blood to come in, take the counters off of one ring to rule them all, get even bigger, and then still be tempted and mill. So I do think that this is a very fun interaction. I don't anticipate this happening very often, at least not to a level that's relevant. But I do think it's fun, and it could still be very cool. So those are our cool interactions. And of course, the last thing we got to do with our deck tech is talk a little bit about the deck's price. So this week, our price came in at $98.16, so very close to our budget limit. And the most expensive card in the entire deck is actually Hex Parasite. And Hex Parasite is one mana for a 1-1 artifact creature insect. You can pay X and a Phyrexian black to remove up to X counters from target permanent. For each counter removed this way, Hex Parasite gets plus 1 plus 0 until the end of turn. So this can be a very effective and cheap way to remove a bunch of counters from our sagas, because it's really only going to cost us X mana to remove X counters, plus, you know, probably 2 life, because we're going to spend that for the Phyrexian black. But it's still relevant because it's one of the most efficient ways to remove counters, and it's one of the most repeatable. It doesn't require tapping. It doesn't require any other like buyback stuff like that. It's just pay X, do the thing. So Hex Parasite is very strong in this deck, and it can also kind of turn into a win condition on its own. We can just remove all the counters from all of our sagas, make it a huge beater, and just slam into our opponents. But if you do need to trim it out of the deck for budget purposes, it does cut the deck down to below $90, which is relevant. It's a much bigger jump to go from 90 to 100 so if you do need to cut it, then that is something you can do. On the other hand, if you're looking to actually increase the price of the deck by increasing the budget of the deck, then I do have a card that I would recommend putting in and a card that I would recommend taking out. So the card that I would put in if you don't really care too much about the budget would be Undo Spirit Dancer. An Undo Spirit Dancer is four and a white for a 3-3 core cleric. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you may create a token that's a copy of it. Do this only once each turn. Now, what's not immediately apparent here is that this triggers on sagas. Now, as long as we're only really playing one saga each turn, which is kind of what we're doing anyway, we are making a token copy of that enchantment. And the nice thing is, it's a May ability that we can only do once each turn. It doesn't trigger once each turn. So if we have multiple sagas in our hands, we can cast one, say, no, I don't want to copy it because I want to copy this other one, and then cast it and copy it. The downside to this is that Undo Spirit Dancer is a massive $17.63. So unfortunately, a little out of our price range, but if you don't mind the price of it, or if you already have one and need to slot it in, it would be a very good improvement to the deck. And the card that I would recommend taking out for it, which unfortunately is only 10 cents, so it is a huge budget increase, is Teachings of the Kirin. And Teachings of the Kirin is one and a green, and it comes in as a saga. 
Level 1, mill 3 cards, make a 1-1 spirit creature token. Level 2, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature you control. And level 3, exile this saga, then return it to the battlefield transformed under your control. And when it transforms, it turns into Kirin Touched Orochi, which is a 1-1 snake monk. And whenever it attacks, choose 1. Exile target creature card from a graveyard. When you do, make a 1-1 spirit token. Or, exile target non-creature card from a graveyard. When you do, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Now, this isn't a bad card, and I don't want to say take it out because it's not good. It is very good, but unfortunately, it really doesn't do as much as Ondu Spirit Dancer would in the deck. Because once we have flipped it, it's got to attack to do its thing and we really don't intend to be attacking all that much especially with a 1-1 so it's not that great but obviously it's not the worst either it's not ideal in the sense that we don't really want to flip it because we want to keep hitting its last ability but its last ability is to flip it so we're not actually getting much value out of it so there's a lot of places where it really misses unfortunately and i do think that Andu spirit dancer would be better overall in the deck but obviously for budget purposes i would probably stick with the touchings of the kieran so moving on then to the game itself. We can't just talk about this deck. We've got to see how it performs in a game. Before we get to that, though, I do want to take a second to shout out some ways that you can help support the channel if that's something you're interested in doing. And of course, shout out our patrons as well. So you get a ton of benefits from joining us over on the Patreon or right here on YouTube as a channel member. You get the deck lists a week early a card sent to you, a Discord that you'll get to join where we film all of the videos and also talk a little bit about building the decks. And of course, you get to join a great community. I do genuinely really enjoy the people that are in our Discord. Everybody's great. They're a good time to play with, good time to talk with. So if you're interested in joining a community like that, please do consider joining us on Patreon, where you can join the amazing people listed below, such as William Swiftfoot, Doodle, Calvin Schmidt, Eric Huey, Jeff Winger, Jeffrey Boos, Salty and Sunshine, Tyler Esme, Sven von Nimwigen, and Paddy Wack. And if you're not interested in that, I do completely understand. Not the thing for everybody, but if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel, I really would appreciate that. We're trying to hit a thousand subscribers before the end of the year, so share the video with people who you think might like it. Let's see if we can get there. It would be a great end of the year gift. But with all of that being said, Let's move on to our actual game, and let's see how this deck performs. So, of course, we got to talk about our opponents and see what they're bringing to the table. So this week, we are joined by Jason playing Elrond, Master of Healing, Sean playing Gork, His Infinite Sorrow, and Bilal playing Dalsum, Pliable Pacifist. So Jason and his Elrond deck. This is a mix of a Scry deck and an Elf deck. Um, we've actually seen this deck before, so you might look a little bit familiar. But it is a little bit of Jason's specialty to play plus one, plus one counter decks and scry decks. So I am very concerned about what Elrond can do, especially because I know it's also got elf synergies, and I know elves can be very, very powerful as well with the creature synergies in green and the card draw synergies in blue. So I am very concerned about what this deck can bring to the table, but I am also very interested in seeing it. Next up, Sean and his Gork deck. Um, this is another deck that has shown up on the channel before, and you may be wondering why this card is here and where did it come from? And this is a custom card created by Sean, and in fact, the entire deck that he's going to play today are custom cards that he created. So everything in there is unfortunately not a quote-unquote legal magic card. But I will make sure to put his deck list in the description of the video. So if you're interested in the actual um, deck list itself, I'm sure that he would love to get a little bit of feedback. I know he's been trying to work with it in our Discord to make sure that it's kind of a legal set of cards. Not legal in the sense that you can just play them in commander decks, but legal in the sense that they could be printed commander cards. So I'm sure if you have any suggestions, he would love to hear them. I know I certainly would. So I'm putting that in the description of the video. Please do comment and let us know kind of what you think, if there's any improvements that could be made, or if things maybe are a little too strong or not strong enough. So let us know. But I am very interested to see how it goes, because unfortunately, last time he was on the channel with this deck, it didn't quite do too much. But finally, rounding out our trio of opponents, 
we have Bilal playing Dalsum Pliable Pacifist. And this is a Selesnia deck that cares about attacking, but it's also kind of caring about creatures that want to deal combat damage and creatures that have more toughness than they do power. Because in Dalsum's case, he wants to make sure that he is attacking in with a very low power creature. And then since it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power, as long as it has greater toughness than it does power, it's not going to die in combat. And then he's able to untap it and draw cards, and it's got hexproof if it's attacking, and it can just kind of do a whole bunch of stuff. So he wants to play the aggressive strategy while also still being defensive by untapping his attacking creatures since they've got reach. And it's going to be very interesting to see. He's played this deck a couple of times, but I don't think he's ever really gotten it to go off, so I am very excited to see what it can do. And Dalsim just seems like a very cool commander to me. But those are our opponents for this week, so let me know down in the comments if any of them seem a little bit more uh, concerning, I suppose, for our deck to face than the others. But other than all of that, I hope you enjoy it. I know I certainly will, and I will talk to you all once the game is done. At the start of the game, Jason goes first, followed by myself, Sean, and then Bilal. On Jason's first turn, he plays a Simic Guildgate. I play an Azorius Guildgate. Sean plays a Forest. Bilal plays a Forest and casts Elvish Mystic. Jason plays a Yavi Maya, Cradle of Growth, turning all lands into forests in addition to their other types, and also casts a Kura Tribe Elder. I play a Gateway Plaza, paying one mana when it enters so that it's not sacrificed. Sean plays a Swamp and casts Maggot Man Wandering Prophet, surveilling one when it enters and also tapping to exile a card from a graveyard to add a green or black mana. In response, Jason sacrifices Sakura Tribe Elder to search his library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. Bilal plays a Plains. Jason casts Elvish Mariner, scrying one when it attacks and tapping a number of non-land permanents equal to the number of cards looked at whenever he scries. He then plays a Simic Growth Chamber, returning an island to his hand. I play a Path of Ancestry and cast Long List of the Ents, letting me note a creature type, and then whenever I cast a creature spell of that type this turn, it enters with an additional plus one plus one counter. This time I note Brushwag. Sean plays a Swamp and activates Maggot Man, exiling Jason's Sakura Tribe Elder, and then casts his commander Gork His Infinite Sorrow, letting him pay a mana whenever he casts a non-creature spell to do damage to any target equal to the spell's mana value and also do one damage to Gork. Bilal plays a Forest and casts his commander, Dalsim Pliable Pacifist, untapping his creatures when they attack if they have reach, preventing them from being blocked by creatures with greater power, and letting him draw a card whenever a creature he controls deals combat damage to a player. Jason plays a Vine Glimmer Snarl untapped, revealing an island, and casts Lost Isle Calling, letting him put a verse counter on it whenever he scries, then he can pay 6 mana and sacrifice it to draw cards equal to the verse counters on it, taking an extra turn if it had 7 or more. He also cast Elvish Archdruid, giving his other elves plus 1 plus 1. He attacks Bilal for 4 with his Mariner, scrying 1, tapping Elvish Mystic, and putting a counter on Lost Isle. I play an Exotic Orchard and cast Guild Summit, tapping a gate when it enters to draw a card, and also drawing a card whenever a gate enters the battlefield under my control. I also remember that I should have noted a creature type for Long List of the Ents, so I name Squirrel. Sean plays a Forest and casts Gorgon's Nesting Pit, revealing the top card of his library in his upkeep, putting it into his hand, and losing life equal to its mana value. He also pays for Gork's ability, doing 1 damage to Gork and 3 damage to Elvish Archdruid, killing it. Bilal plays a Temple of Plenty, scrying 1, then attacks me for 1 with Dalsim, untapping him and drawing a card. In his second main phase, he casts Arasta of the Endless Web, making a 1-2 spider token whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery. Jason plays an island and casts his commander Elrond, Master of Healing, letting him put a plus one plus one counter on a number of creatures equal to the cards he looks at while scrying whenever he scries. Then he also gets to draw a card whenever an opponent targets one of his creatures with a plus one plus one counter on it. Then he attacks me with the Mariner, scrying one, tapping Gork, putting a verse counter on Lost Isle Calling, and putting a counter on Elrond, hitting me for three. In his second main phase, he casts Mirror of Galadriel. 
When I draw for my turn, I note Fairy for Long List of the Ents, then I play a Boros Guildgate, drawing a card, and cast the Akroan War, gaining control of Arasta for as long as it's in play. In Sean's upkeep, he reveals a 6 mana spell with Gorgon's Nesting Pit, losing 6 life and putting it into his hand. He then plays a Swamp and casts Gork's Unholy Reward, letting him make a 1 1 zombie token that can sacrifice itself to make a black mana whenever he's attacked by a creature. Then he also pays a mana to do 1 damage to Gork and 4 damage to Jason. Bilal plays a Plains and cast Vivian Reed, activating her plus one ability to look at the top four cards of his library, putting a creature or land from among them into his hand and the rest on the bottom. This ends with him putting an Archon of Coronation into his hand, then he moves to combat, attacking me for one with Dalsim, untapping him, and drawing a card. Jason plays a forest and casts Rishkar Pima Renegade, putting a plus one plus one counter on itself and the Mariner when it enters, and also letting any of his creatures with plus one plus one counters tap for a green mana. He then attacks Vivian with the Mariner and Elrond, scrying one, tapping the Elvish Mystic, putting a verse counter on Lost Isle Calling, and putting another plus one plus one counter on the Mariner. Then Bilal chooses not to block, letting Vivian take dead damage and go to the graveyard. In his second main phase, Jason casts Cultivate, searching his library for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other into his hand, making me a spider token with a Rasta. When I draw for my turn, I name Bard with Long List of the Ents, and the Akroan War forces my opponent's creatures to attack until my next turn if able. I play a Selesnia Guildgate, drawing a card, then cast my commander Tom Bombadil, which currently has Hexproof and Indestructible since I have four lore counters among sagas I control, and he also lets me, once a turn, when the final chapter ability of a saga I control resolves, to reveal cards from the top of my library until I reveal a saga, putting it into play. Then, since he's a bard, he gets a plus one plus one counter. In Sean's upkeep, he forgets to reveal a card to Gorgon Nesting Pit so he doesn't lose any life. Then he taps Maggot Man, exiling Vivian from Bilal's graveyard, and casts Gork's Will, letting all lands tap for an additional black until the end of turn. With that, he casts the Tide of Night, which has Vanishing 4, and also forces each player to separate all of their non-land permanents into two piles, turning one pile face down, making them 2-2 manifest creatures, and tapping the permanents in the other pile. Finally, it gives all face-up creatures minus 1, minus 1. This results in Guild Summit, a Spider Token, Dalsim, Gork, Maggot Man, Elvish Mariner, Elrond, and Rishkar, all being turned face down, while Elvish Mystic dies to the minus 1, minus 1. He also pays one for Gork, doing one damage to itself and five to Arasta, killing her. Once that resolves, Sean casts Parasite Gorger, which can tap to do one damage to target player, and also force a player to discard a card when it deals damage to them. He moves to combat and attacks Jason for two. Bilal plays a Fortified Village and activates the Manifest ability of Dalsim, turning him face up, and attacks me for zero. Jason plays an Island and casts Guardian Project, letting him draw a card whenever a creature enters the battlefield under his control, as long as it doesn't share a name with any other creature he controls. He then manifests Elvish Mariner, turning it face up, and attacks Sean with his entire board for ten, scrying one, tapping the Parasite Gorger, and putting a Verse Counter on Lost Isle Calling. On attacks, Sean makes three zombie tokens, but they immediately died to the negative one, negative one from the Tide of Night. When I draw for turn, I name Cat with Long List of the Ents, then also trigger the final ability of the Akroan War, making each tapped creature do damage to itself equal to its power, destroying all of Jason's and Sean's creatures. However, before that ability can resolve and sacrifice the saga, I cast Clock Spinning with Buyback so that it goes to my hand when it resolves. This lets me remove a counter from the Akroan War, meaning it doesn't sacrifice itself when the ability resolves. It does, however, still trigger Tom Bombadil because the final chapter ability of a saga resolved, so I reveal cards from the top of my library until I reveal a saga. This winds up being Restoration of Iganjo, putting it into play, searching my library for a planes, putting it into my hand. Then I play the World Tree, letting my lands tap for a mana of any color, and I attack Sean for four with two of my manifests. 
In Sean's upkeep, he removes a vanishing counter from the Tide of Night and reveals a forest for Gorgon's nesting pit, so he loses no life. He then plays a forest and recasts his commander, Gork. Bilal casts Archon of Coronation, becoming the Monarch and preventing his life from changing due to damage for as long as he remains the Monarch. He then attacks me for zero, untapping Dalsim, and at the end of turn, draws a card for being the Monarch. Jason plays a Forest and recasts his commander Elrond, drawing a card, then casts Gyre Sage, which has Evolve, and taps for mana equal to the number of plus one plus one counters on it, also drawing another card. When I draw for my turn, I name Spirit for Long List of the Ents, sacrificing it, discard a card for Restoration of Iganjo, returning Metamized Prophecy from my graveyard to the battlefield, scrying two, then make all tapped creatures do damage to themselves equal to their power. Since I sacrificed Long List of the Ents, this triggers Tom Bombadil, so I reveal cards from the top of my library until I reveal the Horus Heresy putting it into play. This lets me gain control of a non-legendary creature for each opponent, taking Gyre Sage and Archon of Coronation. Before the Akroan War fully resolves, I once again cast Clock Spinning with Buyback to remove a counter from it, not sacrificing it. Then I play a Forest and cast Eidolon of Blossoms, entering with a plus one plus one counter since it's a spirit, and also drawing a card whenever it or another enchantment enters under my control. This triggers Evolve on the Gyre Sage, putting a plus one plus one counter on it. In Sean's upkeep, he loses 3 life to Gorgon Nesting Pit, revealing Nylax, Deity of Pain. He then plays a Swamp and casts Hope's Endured Agony, letting each player pay any amount of life to put that many minus 1 minus 1 counters divided as they choose among any number of target creatures. This has Sean paying 2 life to kill my Eidolon, Bilal playing 4 life to kill my 2 Manifests, Jason paying 4 life to kill the Archon, and me paying 2 life to kill Gork. Once that resolves, Sean casts Noel Cook, which can tap to sacrifice a creature and gain Sean 3 life and scry 1, or if the creature had 3 or more power, he can draw a card rather than scry. On Bilal's turn, he casts Pelucranos Reborn, and also casts Legolas Greenleaf. Jason plays a Command Tower and activates Mirror of Galadriel, scrying one, putting a counter on Lost Isle Calling, putting a plus one plus one counter on Elrond, and drawing a card. He then casts a Beast Within, destroying my Horus Heresy and making me a 3-3 Beast Token instead. When I draw for my turn, I name one ring to rule them all with Metamized Prophecy, transform Restoration of Iganjo into Architect of Restoration, and all tapped creatures do damage to themselves equal to their power. Before that resolves though, I cast Clock Spinning with Buyback to remove a counter from the Akroan War, not sacrificing it. I do, however, still trigger Tom Bombadil, revealing cards from my library until I reveal the Kami War, putting it into play and exiling Pelucranos. After that, I cast the Tessin Champion, letting me draw a card and put a plus one plus one counter on it whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under my control. I move to combat and attack Sean for two with my Beast Token. In Sean's upkeep, he reveals Morn with Gorgon Nesting Pit losing three life and sacrifices the Tide of Night. He then plays a Swamp and casts the Howls of Lost Wolves, putting a plus one plus one counter on all his creatures in his upkeep but sacrificing the wolves if he ever controls seven or more creatures. After that, he casts Nylax, Deity of Pain, doing two damage to any target in his upkeep, and also drawing a card and losing a life whenever a creature dealt damage by Nylax dies this turn. Bilal casts Shalai, Voice of Plenty, giving himself and his other creatures hexproof, then attacks me for one with Dalsim and two with Legolas, untapping them both. Then I block Legolas, taking one damage while Bilal draws a card. Then in his end step, he draws a card since he's still the Monarch. Jason casts Arwen's Gift, scrying two, drawing two, putting a plus one plus one counter on Elrond, and putting a verse counter on Lost Isle Calling. He then plays a Forest and activates Lost Isle Calling, exiling it, drawing seven cards since it had seven verse counters on it, and also taking an extra turn after this one. Then he casts a Soul Ring, followed up by casting Psychic Impetus, enchanting Satessan Champion, giving it plus two plus two, goading it, and letting Jason scry two whenever it attacks. In response though, 
Sean cast Gork's Fury, having his wolves fight my Satessan champion, killing it and exiling it when it dies. Jason then passes to his extra turn and plays a Flooded Grove, and unfortunately Jason has some technical issues here so his camera is sideways for a little while, but don't worry, we fix it eventually. He then casts Marwyn the Nurturer, drawing a card and putting a plus one plus one counter on it whenever another elf enters the battlefield, letting it tap for green mana equal to its power. He also casts Celeborn the Wise, drawing a card, putting a counter on Marwyn, letting him scry one when he attacks with one or more elves, and giving Celeborn plus one plus one until the end of turn for each card Jason looks at while scrying. Then he casts Canopy Tactician, drawing a card, putting a counter on Marwyn, and casts Sentinel Totem, scrying one, putting a counter on Celeborn. Then he casts Lifecrafter's Bestiary, scrying one in his upkeep and letting him pay a green mana to draw a card whenever he casts a creature spell. When I draw for my turn, all my sagas trigger, returning Shalai to Bilal's hand, making each opponent discard a card, letting me draw two cards when I cast one ring to rule them all this turn, and having each tapped creature do damage to itself equal to its power. Then in response to the final trigger of the Akroan War, I cast Clock Spinning to, once again, remove a counter from it, not sacrificing it, but triggering Tom Bombadil, revealing cards until I hit Teachings of the Kirin, putting it into play, milling three cards, and making a 1-1 Spirit. Once all that is resolved, I cast Circuitous Root, searching my library for two gates, putting them into play tapped. Notably, I get Baldur's Gate, which taps for any amount of mana equal to the gates I control, and Gond Gate, letting my gates enter untapped. I move to combat and attack Bilal for three, making a spirit token when Architect of Restoration attacks, and Bilal blocks with Legolas, but before the damage, he casts Path to Exile, exiling his own Legolas to search his library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped. In Sean's upkeep, all of his creatures get a plus one plus one counter, and he does two damage to one of my spirits, exiling it when it dies, then reveals Kaliox, God in Exile, with Gorgon Nesting Pit, losing four life. He casts Minor Inconvenience, exiling target artifact, enchantment, planeswalker, or land, exiling his own Gorgon's Nesting Pit so he doesn't die to the life loss. Then he casts the Forever Departed, letting him put a plus one plus one counter on target creature he controls whenever a creature he controls dies. Bilal plays a Plains and casts Titan of Industry, putting a shield counter on it and destroying the Kami War when it enters. Then he draws a card in his end step since he's still the Monarch. In Jason's upkeep, he scries one with Lifecrafter's Bestiary, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn. He then casts Elvish Guidance, enchanting a forest, letting it tap for green mana equal to the number of elves in play. After that, he casts Farhaven Elf, searching his library for a basic land, putting it into play tapped, drawing a card, and putting a counter on Marwyn. He also casts Paradise Druid, drawing a card, putting another counter on Marwyn, and activates the Mirror of Galadriel, scrying one, drawing a card, and putting a plus one plus one counter on the Farhaven Elf. After that, he casts Armorcraft Judge, drawing a card when it enters for each other creature he controls with a plus one plus one counter, drawing a total of five cards, including the one from Guardian Project. Then he plays a Temple of Mystery, scrying one, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn, casts Song of Arendil, scrying two, drawing two, putting a plus one plus one counter on Elrond and Celeborn. Still going, he casts Arwen Undomiel, letting him put a plus one plus one counter on target creature whenever he scries, drawing a card and putting a counter on Marwyn. After that, he casts Galadriel of Lothlorien, letting him reveal the top card of his library whenever he scries and put the top card of his library into play if it's a land. This also draws him a card and puts a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn. Finally, he moves to combat and attacks me for 13 damage with Elrond and Celeborn. I block with Tom Bombadil and a spirit, only losing the spirit since Tom is still indestructible. In my upkeep, I cast Clock Spinning with Buyback, removing a counter from the Akroan War, this means that when I draw for my turn, it forces all creatures my opponents control to attack until my next turn of Fable. Then I look at the top card of each player's library, sacrificing Metamize Prophecy, revealing cards from the top of my library until I reveal of Herbs and Stewed Rabbit, putting it into play, putting two total plus one plus one counters on Tom Bombadil, and making a food token. Then I play a Heap Gate and cast Thief of Blood, which removes all counters from all permanents and gets plus one plus one counters equal to the total number of counters removed, getting 26 counters. 
After that, I cast one ring to rule them all, getting tempted by the ring, making Thief of Blood my ring bearer, and then making each player mill cards equal to the power of my ring bearer, which is 27. In Sean's upkeep, he puts a plus one plus one counter on all his creatures and does two damage to Gyre Sage, killing it, losing him a life, and drawing a card. Then he casts Shard of Sunlight, which is an artifact that can be sacrificed to give his creature Shroud until the end of turn, sacrifices the Forever Departed with Noel Cook to gain three life, and activates the Departed's own ability to return it to play since another creature died this turn. He also casts Kaliox, God in Exile, exiling two cards from players' graveyards, this time hitting the Horus Heresy and the Kami War. Then, in his end step, he exiles Kaliox and returns it to play in his next upkeep. He moves to combat, attacking Bilal for two, taking the Monarchy, and also attacks Jason for four. In Sean's end step, he exiles Kaliox and draws a card for being the Monarch, and still in Sean's end step, Jason casts Voyage's End, returning Thief of Blood to my hand, scrying one, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn and on Galadriel. Bilal plays a forest and casts the Great Henge, letting his creatures enter with a plus one plus one counter and letting him draw a card whenever a creature enters under his control. He then cast Wilson Refined Grizzly, drawing a card, cast Kodama of the West Tree, drawing a card, and letting him search his library for basic land, putting into play tapped whenever he deals combat damage to a player with a modified creature. He also mutates Gem Razor on top of Wilson, destroying the first Akroan War, and attacks me for 7 and Sean for 1, retaking the Monarchy, drawing for it at the end of turn, although Sean does get to make a 1-1 zombie token since he was attacked. In Jason's upkeep, he scries 1, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Galadriel and Marwyn. Then, when he draws for turn, he scries 2 and draws 2, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Elrond, Galadriel, and Celeborn. He plays a Rejuvenating Spring and activates the Mirror of Galadriel, scrying 1, drawing a card, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Galadriel and Marwyn. He also casts Dwynen Giltleaf Dane, drawing a card, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn, giving his other elves plus one plus one, and whenever Dwynen attacks, Jason gains one life for each attacking elf he controls. After that, he casts Glorfindel Dauntless Rescuer, putting another counter on Marwyn, drawing a card, and giving Glorfindel plus one plus one whenever Jason scries. He casts Mirkwood Trapper, giving target attacking creature minus 2 minus 0 whenever a creature attacks Jason, and gives an attacking creature plus 2 plus 0 whenever they attack someone other than Jason. This also draws him a card and puts a counter on Marwyn. He casts Witching Well, scrying 2, putting a counter on Galadriel, Celeborn, and Marwyn. Casts Fathom Mage, drawing a card whenever a plus 1 plus 1 counter is put on it. This draws him another card and puts a counter on Marwyn. He casts Imperius Perfect, giving his other elves plus one plus one, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn and drawing a card. He also casts Omen of the Sea, scrying two, drawing a card, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn, Galadriel, and Elrond. He casts Preordain, scrying two, drawing a card, putting a plus one plus one counter on Marwyn, Galadriel, and Celeborn. He finally moves to combat, attacking me for 41 damage and Bilal for a total of 16. I block Marwyn and Galadriel with my Architect and Beast, killing them both, making a Spirit and only taking 17 damage, while Bilal blocks 10, taking 6 and killing 2 of Jason's Elves. Before damage though, Jason cast Wrap in Vigor, regenerating all creatures he controls. When I draw for my turn, I put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Tom Bombadil, make a Food Token, Mill 3, make a Spirit Token, and destroy all non-legendary creatures with one ring to rule them all. In response, Jason casts Heroic Intervention, giving all his permanents hexproof and indestructible until the end of turn. Once that resolves, I cast Clock Spinning with Buyback twice, putting a lore counter on one ring to rule them all, then removing it with the final trigger on the stack. This makes each of my opponents lose a life for each creature in their graveyards. Bilal has a response though, evoking Endurance to shuffle his graveyard into his library, then the trigger resolves, making Sean lose exactly 9 life, being knocked out of the game, and makes Jason lose 12. Then I'm able to cast Clock Spinning with Buyback again, making each opponent lose life for the number of creatures in their graveyards again, putting Jason to only 2 life. This time I sacrifice one ring to rule them all, triggering Tom Bombadil and revealing Showdown of the Scalds putting it into play, exiling the top 4 cards of my library, being able to play them until the end of my next turn. Unfortunately, knowing I can't stop Bilal's attack, 
I decide to attack Jason for 5 with Tom Bombadil, knocking him out of the game. This does let Bilal simply untap and attack on his turn, knocking me out and winning Bilal the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. Now, I'm not going to lie to you up front, this was a very long game. This game uh, in person took over two hours to finish, so a lot of us were getting very tired by the end of it, so you might have seen some mistakes at the end with people either not blocking or not using cards that they had on the board, but if I'm being perfectly honest, we were all incredibly tired, so there were probably some mistakes that were made, so I do apologize for that. But... With that being said, I do think that everybody's decks really did what they wanted to do, and I was very impressed with everybody. So, I guess starting off with Sean and his custom-generated deck, it was very cool to see some of the synergies that he made and cards that really just made sense, even though they weren't real cards, obviously. They still made sense that they probably could have been printed and it wouldn't have been too much of a problem. It felt like everything really stuck into the color pie very well, and things weren't super overpowered, they weren't super underpowered. So I think it was very well done and a very good mix of cards in there. So very, very cool showing. And like the sacrifice synergies and graveyard stuff was very up Sean's alley. So very cool to see that. Hopefully we'll get to see it again. Um, Bilal's deck, his Dalsum deck, this is going to be a weird thing to say, but unfortunately it really didn't do much. I know he wound up winning, but it felt like he kind of just got in for one damage once in a while with Dalsum and drew a couple cards here and there, and it didn't seem like he was really affecting the board state too much until, of course, we got to the end and he dropped a massive Titan of Industry and a bunch of other creatures that either had to be destroyed or anything else like Pelucranos, so... Definitely a very cool showing. Um, unfortunately, he started off a little bit slow, but he got there in the end, which was very cool to see. And then Jason's deck was probably the most terrifying deck at the table. I think that if he had found a way to give his entire board trample, he could have just knocked everybody out on that final turn because he was putting plus one, plus one counters on everything that he had and scrying to try to find everything. We were very lucky that at the end of the game when I milled everybody with the one ring to rule them all, I actually milled over his crater hoof behemoth because that would have just ended the game right there. But it was still very cool to see. And a little peek behind the scenes, when I type up what I'm going to say for the actual voiceover for the games, I have to make sure that I'm reading out every ability that triggers and everything. And there were multiple turns that Jason had where my notes were a page or longer because it was just so much scrying and so much counters and so many things coming into play. So it was very, very impressive. I was very impressed by that deck. And then... Of course, we can't end the video without talking about our own deck because that's what this whole thing has been about. Tom Bombadil really impressed me, but I would be lying if I said that I... In I don't want to say I didn't enjoy playing the deck, but it wasn't my style of deck. <laughs> there was too much thinking for how tired I was by the end of this. So if you don't want a deck that does involve a lot of thinking it involves a lot of planning ahead you have to be very specific about the sagas that you trigger when you trigger them what you do with them there's a lot of brain process involved so if that's not something you're interested in then i would probably recommend maybe skipping this one but if you do love a challenge not necessarily from your opponents but just from the skill level it takes to play a deck then I think this could be the perfect deck for you because it really does involve a lot of intensive thought and strategy and planning. And while that is very cool, like I said, I was very tired at the end of this game. My brain was not functioning to the level I was hoping it would. So I probably wasn't playing it as optimally as I could have been. But I do think it was a ton of fun in the moment, but wow, it was a lot of math. It was a lot of dice. It was a lot of triggers. So very, very cool showing, and the synergies were just very impressive. Um, clock spinning, definitely the MVP. The Acroan War put in a lot more work than I thought it would. So overall, I was very impressed by how powerful the deck felt because I truly felt for most of the game that I was the arch enemy. Um, everyone was kind of teaming up against me, and for a lot of it, they couldn't stop me until, of course, the very end. So very, very cool showing by our deck. I really enjoyed it definitely a thinking person's deck but if you're interested in this at all please do check it out i've got the deck list in the link to the video if you want to see the full deck list please do like the video and subscribe to the channel i really hope you enjoyed it i certainly enjoyed making it and with all of that being said i'll see you all on the other side of the dungeon learner's guide <laughs>